Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get this started again. Again, we're in the 1950s. Eisenhower is the president, and it's a post-war economy. So we've been talking a lot about suburbs, babies, all kinds of stuff like that, GI Bill, veterans going back to school, making some money. Everybody's buying cars, and highways are being built, and teenagers are doing what teenagers do. So the next thing we need to really kind of talk about is um, consensus and conformity organized labor. This is going to be kind of a little bit of out of the blue, but we do need to talk about the fact that after World War II, labor unions actually increase not only in power, um, but they also start to strike more often because they don't have to worry about striking and hurting the war. So labor unions are going to come full circle. In fact, um, it was after um, VJ Day, you know, the victory over Japan, their, their strikes were tending to run longer. And so what Eisenhower um, and Congress are going to be faced with is the fact that if people strike, it's going to upset the economy and that's not going to be good. So these two senators, Taft and Hartley, go ahead and get their names down, make sure you get their names down, circle it. They are going to sponsor a bill that's going to become known as the Taft-Hartley Act, also technically known as the Labor Management Relations Act of 47. But to do this, okay, um, they actually have to get by um, Truman. And remember, Truman's deal for the American people is supposed to be the fair deal, and he actually wants to empower workers. So actually, um, Truman actually vetoes this Taft-Hartley Act, but they override his veto, another in instance of checks and balances. And basically what the Taft-Hartley Act in the 1940s does is it, and I want you to write this out beside the slide, get ready to write, get ready to write, it amends FDR's Wagner Act. Remember that Wagner Act of the 19, um, uh, the 1930s and 40s um, in which basically it kind of is uh, limiting um, the power um, of business and allowing people to collectively bargain and stuff like that. Well, what it this does is it basically amends that Wagner Act and it makes it a little bit harder for labor unions to strike. Um, it basically merges the two biggest unions. Um, uh, well, it happens because of this. The AFL, American Federation of Labor, remember Samuel Gompers, and the CIO were doing really, really well. In 1955, they are going to merge. And now, even to this day, it's known as the AFL. CIO. Um, so with this, blue-collar workers that had been enjoying middle-class incomes um, were starting to strike. The goal was to preserve and extend compensation and to make sure that things were going okay. I'm going to be really honest with you. It basically limits labor unions' ability to strike, which the labor is not going to like, but the management is going to love. So it's just one thing in the 1950s that kind of you need to know about. Now, there is another thing in the 1950s you need to know about. Everybody's living in the suburbs. What do they do on Sunday? They go to church. Okay, so with the 1950s, again, kind of like in the 1920s, religion is going to become a very hot topic. Mostly in the 1950s, everybody wanted to be religious. Remember, after you live through war, <laughs> you have to find Jesus, okay? You have seen some awful things. And so a lot of people in the 1950s start going to church every single Sunday. Organized religion expands dramatically after World War II. Church and synagogue memberships reached its highest level in U.S. history. Kind of interesting to see right here in 1940, 60 million. By 1960, you have over, well, it pretty much doubled. About 120 million. Thousands of new churches and synagogues built in the where? Read it, read it out loud. Did you read it? Suburbs. Um, why? Because it's another means of socialization in the 1950s. And I do not, do not get me wrong. I, I am a churchgoer myself. But you have to think about it. Sometimes in the 1950s, this becomes an aspect of socialization. You go to church to see people as well. In the suburbs, everybody's worried about, oh, what kind of car do they have? Or the little girls are like, oh, she has a new washing machine. I need a new washing machine. So with that, the idea of going to church is another aspect of conformity sometimes in the 1950s. Um, and there is a guy that pops up you need to know about. Make sure you know his name. I am going to test you on it. He's actually going to become so unbelievably famous. His name is Billy Graham. He's going to touch the lives of so many people. And it's in the 1950s that he becomes basically, and you can notice this right here, God's ambassador um, is what it's called right here. He literally becomes one of the most influential people in the 1950s that is going to help spread religion. Um, now, with that, one last thing before we get to civil rights, progress through science of the 1950s. 
pause this and get it down. Now with this, I went ahead and added um, science and technology. The first thing you're writing down is in 1951, IBM creates a computer. And there is a picture of it on the slide. That man is standing next to one computer. Unbelievable, isn't it? Um, computers used to fill up a room. Now we have them in our pockets. Because let's be honest, our iPhones, our Galaxies, they're all they're all computers. There is more computing power in your small little smartphone than there was on the first basic um, NASA mission to the moon. Okay, um, That in and of itself is unbelievable technology. 1952, the first hydrogen bomb is tested. 1953, DNA structure is discovered. Here's one I need you to star. Huge, massive, important. In fact, I think you already wrote it down. Okay, 1954, the polio vaccine is tested. You need to know the inventor of this vaccine, Jonas Salk. Now, why do you think he has a vaccine for polio first? Who, what famous person had polio? Ah, FDR. Well, in 1954, this is one of the very first vaccines that gets tested, and it shows not only our progress through technology, through science, but also through medicine. In 1957, you have your first commercial U.S. power nuclear power plant. Ooh, that's interesting. And then in 1958, NASA is going to be created, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. There's something that actually causes that. But all this progress through technology is absolutely unimportant to know. Ooh, here's a really good EOC test question. I might go through this one with you. What is the best title for this cartoon? You notice we have a middle class. They're all cruising. Yay. Then you have a fountain. It says pent-up consumer demand. Cold War military spending. New industries. Housing boom suburbs, federal highway construction, and they're all dipping, dripping into the U.S. economy. Now with it, what's the best title for this cartoon? Is it causes and effects of economic prosperity, strengths and weaknesses of government and economic policy, reasons for government's economic planning, or major sources of consumer debt? Ooh, well you know if you looked at the dates, it's obviously F because it's the 1950s. Now, ooh, you should know this one, too. I hope you do. All right. We're going to watch this. Oh, civil rights. Big topic. But let me guess. You already know half of it. Okay? So civil rights, here again, you have this scale. You've seen this scale before, right? I use it in this, um, the first semester. Black codes, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, and Jim Crow laws on one side. This is the bad side. 13, 14, 15. What does it mean? Free citizens vote. Which way will the scale tip? We're going to talk about a lot of people. The first person doesn't even have a slide, but man, he should. I kind of screwed up. Jackie Robinson. I want to make sure you understand that Jackie Robinson is the first African-American baseball player in the major leagues. He rose to national prominence in the late 1940s when he helped bring an end to racial segregation in Major League Baseball. In fact, I'm pretty sure that most of you guys have heard of the movie 42. Jackie Robinson is unbelievably important, and he is now officially in your standards that you have to know for U.S. history, so you could see an EOC question over him. Now, this one, oh my goodness, of course you know who this is. Mrs. Rosa Parks. Pause it, get it down. Okay, I did not even give you, oh, I didn't even give you this slide. Totally, never mind. Don't pause it and get it down. You should know it. December 1955, Rosa Parks is on her way home. She refuses to sit at the back of the bus, but she says, I'm going to sit in the front of the bus. And what happens? Of course, she's arrested and fined for $10 for sitting in the white section. But here's the deal. She basically starts a firestorm in Montgomery, Alabama, because she right here, here's a picture of her right here. When she sits in the bus, she is challenging that separate but equal, Plessy versus Ferguson. And with that, actually a lot of people think that, oh, she was just hurting and her her feet were tired and she was a little poor seamstress. No, she was doing it on purpose because she was told to by Martin Luther King Jr. and some of the other leaders. Now this is the one you got to pause and get down. Now the Montgomery bus boycott. You guys know what a boycott is. In fact, circle that word boycott. I'm going to check this. This might be something I check. Boycott. What does it mean if I boycott something? I refuse to basically take part in it. Buy it, sell it, etc. Use it, whatever. 
Now, the boycotts we've talked about is when we boycotted British tea, that kind of stuff like that. But the Montgomery bus boycott is when the African Americans in the city of Montgomery, Alabama, are going to refuse to use the Montgomery buses. On December 5th, when they stopped using the buses through the rain, the African Americans began to boycott the buses. They were led by, oh, here they are, Martin Luther King Jr., he's finally here, and Rosa Parks. 40,000 black commuters walked to work some as far as 20 miles to get around using the buses because they wanted to boycott the buses because they made them sit in the back. They said, if we're paying the same fare, we should be able to sit where we want. And they're absolutely right. The boycott lasts, oh my gosh almighty, 382 days, which means for over a year, almost 70% of the buses were empty because that's normally who rode the buses as African Americans because the whites had cars. So the bus company literally almost goes bankrupt before they say, okay, fine, you can sit where they want. Why was the Montgomery bus boycott so effective? It's easy. What's the easiest way to piss somebody off? Mess with their money. The bus company's finances struggled, and until that, that is exactly what you call an effective boycott. Until that law was called, the segregation's um, for the buses was finally lifted. This is the very first step, and there's Martin Luther King Jr. in starting to take on civil rights. And I love how they did it. They did not get in anybody's faces. They did not break the law. They just said, you're not going to treat us as equals. We're not going to give you our money. And it worked beautifully. Now let's start talking about him, Martin Luther King Jr. Oh my goodness. I need you to pause this and get down the definition of civil disobedience or passive resistance. Okay, so this is the key thing that you need to know about MLK. This included practicing nonviolence and passive resistance such as sit-ins, boycotts, you're going to learn about the freedom rights, and basically doing whatever needed to be done for you to hear my opinion. But I'm going to do it in a way that I don't look bad, but you look bad when you say no. In 1955, he became involved with the Montgomery bus boycott. From then, he went on to deliver numerous powerful speeches. We're going to, of course, talk about the I Have a Dream. Before he was assassinated, ooh, interesting quiz question. I might ask this. Um, in 1968, he had won the Nobel Peace Prize. And oh my gosh, I cannot even begin to tell you how much he deserved it. Remember, I have a what? Dream. Now, Civil rights in and of itself. I'm going to go ahead and get this down, but I have got to talk a lot about this so it might bleed over into the next video. Um, the very first thing we need to talk about is the law of the land had been Plessy versus Ferguson. Yes, separate but equal. We are going to have a court case that comes up in the 1950s. And I'll be honest with you, there are two that come up in the 1940s that challenge it. It's just this one gets the ink in the textbooks. Okay, the civil rights case of Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas. What ends up happening in the 1950s is there is a little girl, okay, African American girl, and their family name is Brown, and she is told she has to go to a black school that is about seven miles away from her house. When there is a perfectly good white school just a mile away from her house that she has to pass to get to the black school, which by the way has basically no books, lights, or anything like that. Her father files suit against the Board of Education. That's where we get Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas. And he said, this is not fair. I don't care if it says it's equal. It isn't equal, and I want answers. In 1954, the Supreme Court overturned Plessy v. Ferguson and the Separate but Equal Doctrine because this family, led by, by the way, the famous lawyer who won this case, he's going to become the very first African-American justice. Are you ready to write his name down? Thurgood Marshall. Because of the NAACPs, that's a Dubois, remember the NAACP? Thurgood Marshall and the case of Brown versus Board of Education states were ordered to integrate their schools. And I am not kidding you guys. This is the biggest, most important court case of the 1900s probably. When Thurgood Marshall wins this, he would represent Brown at trial, later becomes first African American SCOTUS. He will change the way every single school looks in the in well, forever. And I'll be honest with you, all of the schools don't integrate right off the bat. It's going to be forced, but definitely an important thing. But I'll be honest with you, ooh, this is going to be like kind of a suspense thing. This wasn't the first course case 
tune into the next video to find out the next two court cases. But it overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. No longer is it separate but equal. All because of the 14th Amendment. I forgot to write that in. Write 14th Amendment in. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Oh my gosh, time's running out. 14th Amendment, equal protection under citizenship.